you will, open your Bibles uh, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. And we're going to begin reading in verse 27, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. We'll be reading uh, through verse 36. Again, Luke 6, 27. It is not uncommon for me to step up here or uh, even in the course of a sermon to say this is a difficult passage uh, that that which is taught or suggested or derived uh, from this passage is really difficult to understand well we come to a passage today that I would even that I would say is, is a bit difficult to just to understand, let me tell you this, as difficult as it is to understand, it's far more difficult to obey. It's far more difficult to apply these things to your lives. And in the course of the preaching of the sermon today, my suspicion is that I'm going to tie for you or tie you into a bit of a Gordian knot that I'm not going to be able to unravel for you. Um, I'm a little chapped by the text. I expect you to be too, if you're paying attention at all. That how to live this out, how, how Jesus' context 2,000 years ago and our context here in 2020, how do, do we work these things out or how does God work these things out in our lives? Because we are called not to dismiss the difficult things, not to disregard them, but that we take them and obey them. They are ultimately both for the glory of God and ultimately for our own good. And so let's look at this this morning as we think about this ethic of love, and I ask the question, is it radical or normative? Well, the answer is this. It is radical, and it should be normative for the Christian life. That is, the normative way of Christian living is radical when viewed from the perspective of the unbelieving world. And so let us read, beginning in verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you have expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get the same, get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Pray with me this morning. Father, we thank You for Your Word. It is a Word that challenges us at the very core of who we are. And yet, God, in that challenge, we have a renewed sense of your grace. Lord, how we need the grace of obedience, the grace of discernment for this day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to... Luke's version of what we often refer to as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It is interesting that Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives us less than one chapter, while Matthew gives us three. That is, Matthew gives us far more of 
the sermon. But yet, for God's purpose and for Luke's purpose, God inspired Luke to edit and shape Jesus' words in a particular way that suited the purpose of this book, and I would suggest to you, suits the purpose for our preaching here uh, this morning, that we believe all of these things are under the superintendence of Almighty God. And so, as we look at this and we seek to understand and we seek uh, to apply, we run the danger of, of, of putting this to death uh, by a thousand qualifications, uh, as the late Ravi Zacharias would often speak of, that, that, that we can just dismantle this to where it simply means nothing. Or maybe, and it would seem to me, there's a way to so, sometimes it's called a wooden interpretation. We so rigidly, rigidly interpret the text. It would seem to me if the, the logical extent of this uh, rigidity would be a society that would descend into absolute chaos, that there simply would not be any type of, of order that would remain. And so it is a difficult text. And Now, word of warning, you'll stand one day and give an account for listening to it, and I'll stand and give a higher account for preaching it to you, okay? So we need to remember that. But what's my goal? To cut it straight. No compromise. And again, I'm going to leave you with some unanswered questions. And like I say, if it, if, 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 if it doesn't make a sore spot on you, I would suggest to you you haven't listened. Would be my guess. I, I can't. I'm not going to assume that, but I'm just going to say, if this one doesn't hurt a little bit, if this one doesn't challenge you, you haven't paid attention. And so, as we look at this, Jesus speaks, first of all, of the blessedness of the kingdom, and it, it, it is a, a countercultural ideology, and then he warns us of, of supposing that the standards of the world should be our standards, that of, of wealth and popularity and, and satisfaction, that, that there is a profound danger in those things. And then he presses further and begins to exhort and admonish those who listen, and he exhorts and admonishes us today that the way of following him is difficult beyond all imagination. In fact, I would say the way of following him is impossible in of our own strength. And then the, this word of warning that we'll look at next week that I think is an important word for our day. And then a closing exhortation in a few weeks. The hope that we have is ultimately and finally the gospel of Jesus Christ. That if we are not rooted in the gospel, Destruction is our ultimate end. And so, as we look at this today, Jesus begins with a but. That is, he, he is drawing a, a time, a place, a point. I'm, I'm going to change the subject a little bit. I'm moving forward. I'm transitioning to the next issue uh, that I want to raise. And, and I've been speaking, in some sense, to the multitudes. Evidently, this was spoken to a to a larger crowd that was inclusive of those 12 men that Jesus had already called uh, into a, a level of, of intimacy unknown to the, to the others. And so uh, we have those that have already uh, followed Christ, they've already fully invested in Him, and those that are still testing uh, the waters. And it seems to me that when Jesus uh, speaks to those who hear, He is speaking particularly to those twelve and those that have aligned themselves with Him. Again, many times in Scriptures we, we, we see this, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. What does that mean? Well, again, it's similar to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, that the natural man does not understand the things of God because they are indeed spiritually discerned. That is, these things are not appealing and we do not receive them 
And we certainly don't seek to obey them apart from the working of the Spirit of God. And so the Spirit was at work in these disciples. And yes, indeed, I am sure they were challenged as we rightly should be challenged by these words. And so uh, the exhortation to love your enemies. Now, to be truthful, even the Old Testament law would speak of being benevolent towards your enemies. Of course, we have the kill the Amalekites aspects of the Old Testament too. And again, we, we should wrestle with, with all of that as well. Those are difficult uh, ideas. But here, Jesus speaking to them and to us today, we are commanded to love those who actually we would put in the category of enemies. Those that choose to do us harm. Those that, that do not desire our well-being. Jesus commands. He doesn't say, now guys, I've got a few suggestions to you. Your mileage will vary, and, and here's what I want you to do. You think about it, and you see how you feel about this subject. And you see what it means to you, and then, then you kind of work this thing out. No! He says, without any reservations, and without putting it to death with a thousand qualifications, love your enemies. And he's not going to leave it alone. And the truth is, the New Testament doesn't leave it alone. As the apostles lived out their lives under persecu persecution, they reflected upon this. That these fiery trials come for a purpose. That this is a gracious thing when you endure suffering. Well, when, when suffering comes, sometimes it's not at the hands of anybody, but sometimes it's very much at the hand of those that stand in opposition to you. And so, the exhortation or the command, and it, make no mistake, it's a command, is it good news or bad? Well, let me tell you this. Love your enemies is not the gospel. And folks, you always need to be clear about what the gospel is. The gospel is this, it's the good news that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. That is our hope. I don't even love my neighbors. I don't even love my dear children and grandchildren and my wife enough that I would want to stand before God and say, look, look at how much I've loved these folks. I want you to look. Don't, don't you think I deserve heaven because I've loved them so much? You know what the response to that is by God? Go to hell, go directly to hell, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Okay? But he raises the ante. Not just love those that you do deeply care about. He says, love your enemies. And it's a law. And Jesus is preaching the law. Imagine the rich young ruler. All these I have kept since my youth. Anybody want to volunteer that response? Would anybody say to Jesus, when he says, love your enemies, all those I've kept since my youth. Let me tell you about somebody that gossiped about me back in high school and how I loved them so profoundly. Anybody got that testimony? Let me tell you about that co-worker that caused me such great harm and how I loved them unconditionally. Anybody got that story they want to share today? All these I've kept since my youth. The law first reveals the character of God. God is loving. As we're reminded, He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust because loving. The unbeliever, if they're breathing air today, they have experienced the love of God. Okay? He is not required to give them a breath. And so, God is loving even toward those that are in the category of, of His enemies. And He reveals to us that we are to imitate Him, or, and, 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 and we are to obey this because it's a statement of His will. I love it. I love it. I'm just trying to find God's will for your life, for my life. Well, again, I'm, I'm a big fan of the paraphrase of Augustine, love God, hate sin, do what you want to do. Yeah. What's God's will for your life? That you love your enemies. Yeah. 
those people that have really ticked you off. But how does the law function? You know what it does? The law always drives me to the cross. Now this, listen, some of you say, well, I've, I've never stolen anything. I've never been sexually immoral. I don't tell lies and all this. Of course, you're lying then, but, but you can say that if you want to. But love your enemies. You know what it does? It drives me to my knees and I crawl to the foot of the cross. And I give thanks that I have a Savior that has forgiven this man that has not loved his enemies. Okay? So the law drives us to Christ. And it, it is a bit of a check on our claim to be holy. Yes, I have so grown in grace. I so love God. How about those enemies? How you doing there? How are you doing with those enemies? Again, it reminds us of where we are in the journey so many times. And so, in some sense, it is really bad news. Other than the fact it drives me even more deeply into the arms of my Savior, who forgives my sin, which are many. And so, who was their enemy? And, and I, I think for our day, this is vitally important. Jesus is speaking to these guys, and particularly to those disciples. Of course, everybody can hear him. I mean, he's speaking to everybody as well. Guys, don't misunderstand me. This is not Occupy Jerusalem. This is not a, a military or a militant operation. If, if you think by signing on with me that, oh boy, I can't wait to go kick some booty of those Romans. I can't wait. We're going to give them what they deserve. You're at the wrong place. And it was a reminder that that's not what he was all about, or a statement that he was, that's not what he was all about. And then, then it's also kind of a foreshadowing, when you preach the gospel, and you will, men, they'll kick you out of the synagogue, that, that your enemies will be the ones of your own family. That you, will be, that you will be persecuted. You will be indicted by those you love. And guess what? You've got to love them. You've got to love those enemies. And you've got to love people even, even again when they stand in such great opposition to the, to the gospel. That they're actually enemies. They, they seek to destroy, undermine, pervert, distort. You're still to love them. And so at least we can see three groups that certainly are within this realm of who, who were their enemies. Now, I think this is an important question. Who are your enemies? How about that person that cut you off in traffic yesterday or the day before? When you slammed the steering wheel and hit the horn and shook your fist or worse? You ran up and got on their bumper and said, I'll show you. Why are y'all giggling? I know who you are. What's that movie, I Know What You Did Last Summer? I've never seen it. Don't plan to, but I know there's a movie by that name. Yeah. How about I'm getting my stuff there at the grocery store and I'm in a hurry because I'm important. Don't get in my way. And somebody in front of you starts fumbling for that coupon. For the love. For the love. My gosh. Do you not realize I'm in line here? Hey, check out lady. Check out person. Could you just tell them to move out of the way and let me get through here? And then they find this coupon that's out of date. My gosh, I'd have given you 50 cents if you'd just moved on. How about that coworker that's constantly dragging their feet? Makes your work doubly hard because why? You're having to take up their slack. And they never say thank you. They're never appreciative. In fact, they're always... Love 
your enemies. Sometimes the church makes it seem as the abortionists are our enemies. We hate abortion. Think it's a sin. But they're ultimately those that we should love. The sexual revolution people, the social revolution people, they're not our enemies. We're to love them. We're to love them. And so, who is your enemy? Well, you're to love them. You, Jesus, he kind of fleshes it a little bit. Do good to those who hate you. Now, what I really want to do is slap you right upside the head. Now, Tracy, you're giggling. I've, obviously, you have never felt like you wanted to do that to Randy. Never, ever, never. See, I agree. You know, Randy and I agree. Yeah, never been warranted. Do good. Jesus goes on to say to, to bless those who curse, those that speak ill things to you and of you. Bless them, and that, and that's not bless your heart. Y'all do know what bless your heart means. If you don't, if you'll ask me after church, I'll tell you what bless your heart means. But, uh, but yeah. But we are to bless those who verbally abuse us. Those who physically assault us, verse 29. Now, I will tell you, there's, it's interesting to, to read the, the commentaries, and I've, I've got a fair selection of, of commentaries and you know, as I read on these passages each week. I'm not, they're not even sure if he's speaking of what would happen, say, in the context of the synagogue as, as these converted Jews would be kicked out of the synagogue. They might be slapped as a sign of public rebuke. Or if he's t- talking about more what we'd think of as an assault. But whichever we are to endure, as we hear so often, uh, to to turn that other cheek or to offer that other cheek to those that that would actually strike you. That that we're to give, verse 30, to those who beg. Now let me hit a bit of a pause button here. And again... I don't want to dismantle. And I, I don't, I'm not trying to undermine. I'm just asking some questions for you. Because you're going to have to think. If, you're going to have to think about this when you, you know, it, you know, I often talk about the fact that the way that you respond to the Word of God is not always coming down this aisle and crying about the fact that you messed it up the previous week. The way you respond is either you say, yes, Lord, I repent, and now I go out for obedience. Or you say, eh. Eh. Well, that's your response. Eh. So we're going to respond. The response is either yes, Lord, or no, Lord. Not maybe. Maybe is not a response. But as we think about those that threaten us physically or steal our stuff, or even those who beg, let's, let's put it kind of more in our context. What do you do when someone breaks into your house? Middle of the night. They are threatening your family. I knew a man who someone broke into his house. He was asleep in his bed. He jumped on top of him, straddled him, put a pistol in his mouth. What do you do? Now, I will tell you this, and and, and he's not the only one, and as I kind of I mean I wrestled with this this week my understanding is and I I kind of googled it and I I didn't see this exact quote but John Piper who is no slacker John Piper he's solid maybe the most influential evangelical the last 20 years even beyond maybe John MacArthur heaven forbid but yeah maybe but he says he would not defend himself if somebody broke into his home that he would preach the gospel to them he would love them and if that cost him his life, then that's simply the will of God. Now, I have to tell you, I might tell them about Jesus, but they might have a bullet in them when I'm telling them. 
But there is a, that is not an absurd thing. There is a long history. What about Jim Elliott when those Alka Indians descended on them on that, that beach down in, in the Amazon? Had they brought their machine guns to defend themselves? Let me tell you, fo- folks, the gospel has been advanced far more greatly by those who would suffer for the name of Jesus Christ than those who would defend themselves with a weapon. So what about those who would threaten you physically or come to take your stuff? How are we to respond to that, to those who who beg? And I I am sympathetic is not the the right word because I I feel for people that ask for money or food and my general policy, I'll always feed anybody, any place, any time. I'm not real big about giving money. I've got certain reservations about that uh, in terms of empowering people further bad behavior. But all of us know people, and I've got them in my family, that have ruined their lives with drugs and alcohol. And they're constantly needing money. What's the text say? Now, for years, and I've counseled many parents of adult children or older teenage children who were giving them this type of problem and they were bailing them out of jail and they were doing this and they were doing that, you need to cut them off. You need to cut them off. Now, you need to understand, and here, here, you've got to be willing to get the phone call, I found your child under a bridge last night dead. You've got to be willing because I can't guarantee you it works. I can't guarantee you a happy ending. There is no guarantee. But what you're doing is not working so well. But I'm just saying... Jesus didn't say, now, you give to everybody that gives to you, but if somebody has so worn you out and exasperated you and used you to the place that you're sick of it and sick of them, then don't give it to them. He doesn't qualify it. But we've got to think about it. We have to think about it. I've been watching the HBO series, The Band of Brothers. One of the reasons that we struggle so much with obedience to Christ is we have such an unbiblical mindset about our lives in the first place. This is my life, this is my stuff, and they're both for me to enjoy. And there is some truth to that. I'm not saying it's not without... But... It's my stuff, you can't have it. It's my life, don't interrupt it. In the third episode, a man named Spears says to a man named Blythe, who right after they had parachuted into France, uh, this guy just went into panic, and I think he just hid himself in a hole while the fighting went on all around. And after this was over, Spires comes to him and says this to him, the only hope you have is to accept the fact you're already dead. The sooner you accept that, the sooner you will be able to function as a soldier is supposed to function without mercy, without compassion, without remorse. All war depends on it. What I'm saying is, the reason we struggle so much with gospel obedience is that we think about the fact that our lives belong to us, but the reality is our lives belong to God. We have enlisted them in the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're dead. And you keep trying to live and have things your way. Again, I'm not, I'm not unraveling that knot for you. But can you see the analogy? The way you fight a war is you just say, I'm dead. And then you go in and do the job you've been assigned to do. The way you live the Christian life is say, I give up my rights to whatever. I just simply follow Christ. Jesus kind of summarized some of this. We call it the golden rule. And... Every philosophy or philosopher of the ancient world had kind of a a version of this. It usually kind of came in the negative, don't don't do bad things to people if you don't want them to do bad things to you, was kind of 
that way. Jesus kind of turned it and said, you need to treat people the way you would desire them to treat you. Do, do good to them because you would like for them to do good to you. That, that's, again, now, again, that is law. So what is my problem in standing for God? That I've been very selfish. That I don't treat people like I would desire for them to treat me. I treat them basically how I feel about them in the moment. Yeah. So, the exhortation is difficult. It is challenging. It's to love your enemies. And to be sure, as Peter says, it's a gracious thing. It's a grace thing. It's the power of God. To whatever degree that we can pursue this, it is all of grace. And then Jesus amplifies, and, he's, and, he's, and, he, and he simply just says this, that even in a fallen world filled with unbelievers, that people can get along sometimes. I've read one book, and I'm reading a second book on basically the racial issues and uh, the man, a man named Thomas Sowell has written the book I'm reading now, very bright African-American. I think he's in his 90s now. He's talking about slavery, and folks, white Europeans did not invent slavery. It was well on the scene long before the white Europeans came along, and it's been an atrocity, and it's been a way of abusing fellow image bearers for years and years and years and years. I'm just saying that I'm not saying that everybody kind of loves everybody and gets along. But there are places and there are times that people kind of get along okay. As Frank Burns says, and Google it, it's nice to be nice to the nice. Okay? It's, 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 you know, and, I, and I would say to you, if you're trying to make your way in America, being nice a lot of times will work to a certain extent. You know, if you're in business, if you're not nice to your customers, you probably won't have them for very long. So, I mean, it kind of works. But, but Jesus uh, raises the ante. Well, uh, that's no big deal. What benefit is it? The unbelieving world will at times treat people nicely. I'm calling you to a higher standard. I'm calling you to something that's far more difficult than just getting along to get along. That... that that sinners, on occasion, again, I'm not saying 100% of the time because history tells us otherwise, okay? But at times, there's a type of peace among people of certain society and certain cultures, certain civilizations. And, and so, you're no better. And, and, he, and, he, and he, he, Jesus just won't quit. I mean, he just won't quit. He, 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 keeps, he keeps on, and he, he says, well, you know, if you lend to people, well, just give it to them. Because ungodly people lend, expecting their money back. That's just the way that system works. But love, it comes back again, verse 35, love your enemies. One of the ways you do that, if you help them out, you're not expecting a return. I have an acquaintance in my neighborhood that I see out when I'm running, and we got to talking one day about financial issues, and he seemed pretty astute about the ways of money, and he says, I, I don't lend people money, but I will give it to them. There's no sense lending it to people that you know are not going to pay you back. Just give it to them. If that's, if that's, you know, again, I'm sure he doesn't give away all of his money or give to everybody, but, you know, it, he says it just complicates things. And there's some truth uh, in that. And now, so Jesus pushes this thing harder and harder and harder. Again, go beyond what is going on in the culture, what the unbelieving world can does do. Again, verse 35, some, but, but love... Love your enemies. Do good. Now, let me, again, throw, I'm gonna throw a, 
a curveball at you. Again, I mentioned John Piper earlier. And when he mentioned this about he would not fight back if assaulted or threatened, uh, not long af after that, Jerry Falwell Jr., president of Liberty University, after one of the terrorist attacks, encouraged his students to go get carry pistol carrying permits and said, if a terrorist were to show up on our campus, we'll give them what they deserve. And John Piper actually called Jerry Falwell Jr., is my understanding. He said, we need to talk about this. And, I, and, and, I, and from what I gathered, it was you know, a cordial kind of thing between brothers who had a different perspective. But let me say this. It may be a good thing in the overarching sense of things to do that which frustrates or puts a halt to evil. If you say to an unbelieving world that we will never defend ourselves that unbelieving world will get more aggressive in being destructive and eventually they destroy themselves okay and so is it in, in the particular moment if you do physical harm to someone in the name of defending yourself is it not also a warning to others wait a minute I want to go rob somebody, but you know what? They may shoot me. I don't, th I don't think I want to do that. And so when you warn people about their evil, that's a good thing. Again, I'm, not, I'm just throwing some things out that, that we should think about. You may be put in that situation. What I'm telling you is Jesus said what? Love your enemies. And folks, that's not, this is what it means to me. This is what it meant, means to Jesus. Because it is by st His standard we will give an account. And so, the implications, if we look a little further down here. He speaks of reward. And I think that it is a, a rightful thing for Christians to think about laying up treasure in heaven of willingly suffering in this life for the greater cause of Christ. And even in some sense, and again, this is not necessarily temporal, but it is a blessed thing, even if it's a costly thing, to obey God and to honor Him through our obedience, to worship Him. Remember what I talked about, it? worship's 24-7 thing. When you obey God, you're worshiping Him. Okay? And, and so... There, there, there is a, a reward. And now, this is an important theological point there in the middle of verse 35. So if you love your enemies sufficiently, you will be the sons of the Most High. Therefore, go earn your salvation. You will not get into heaven if you don't love your enemies enough. Is that the gospel? I hope it's not. I hope it's not. But do you see what I'm saying? Rightly dividing. Getting it right. What does, he, does he mean we're earning our salvation? Well, ought to think about it. But I think he's saying you will be known. The world will know that something radical has happened in your heart, in your mind, that there is something distinct, that there is something not only worth living for, there is something worth dying for in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They will know that you're of a different stripe. That's why you do your good deeds before men, so they will praise your Father who is in heaven, not so they praise you. And so again, Jesus says simply be merciful. Your, fa your heavenly Father is merciful even to those who hate Him. Mercy, kindness, grace. Even to those who would do your harm. It, it is foundational. It is characteristic of our sacrificial living for the cause of Christ. Remember, you have died. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God, or in Christ with God.
you, you, you've died. You, you don't even... You don't, look, folks, you don't have the right to the next breath. I dare you take my next breath, God. I dare you. No. It's his breath. He lets you utilize it. It's all his. And so, Jesus makes very clear. The Christian gospel is not militant. It's not, we're going to occupy this, we're going to destroy this. It's a gospel of, of love. A love that, that, that stands the test of the greatest adversity, that, that historically, that, that there have been nations won to Christ, and, and that movement began through the martyrdom of someone willing that their blood be shed by the enemies of the gospel. But when they saw the way they suffered and died, the gospel became real and powerful and effective. Jesus modeled this as they crucified him. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And so, is it difficult? Is it something that stretches us? Is it something that rubs you a bit? I hope so. I hope I haven't diminished it. Jesus' command is unwavering. There's no shilly-shallying. There's no negotiating. He says unequivocally, love your enemies. Those that want to harm you, you do them good. At the end of the day, you be merciful. And I, I, and I think that mercy implies even a bit of understanding. If I were in your shoes, maybe. If I were in your circumstance, maybe. Be merciful. Imitating the very character of the one who died for us and showed us that way of love. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace and even for your law. And it is a profound reminder that we do not have the perfected character of our Savior. And so we're thankful for the gospel and we're thankful that one day we will have that perfected character. In this life, we will struggle with obedience. God, I pray that you would work in us, that we would live out lives of radical obedience, that, that the, Lord, the world would look and go, there's, there's just something there. I can't put my finger on it. I can't define it. But oh my goodness, they, they have something that is foundational, there's something that gives them hope, there's something that gives them peace, there's something that even gives them joy in the midst of very difficult times. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.